recording. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you, Autumn. Okay. Uh, let me know if you guys can see the screen because I'm working with three monitors right now. <laughs> we can <laughs> see it. Awesome. All right. Okay. So as Autumn mentioned, we're going to jump into the planned transit service levels. And without further ado, we're going to jump right in. So for this year's budget, um, you know, we want to just focus on the fact that we, we still are maintaining current service levels uh, with some limited restoration, which is based on our um, COA, so our comprehensive operational analysis that was done back in 2021. Um, and then there was also some sections that were um, part of our board recommendations. Um, the planned service levels include a little over 93 hours of revenue um, service and then a little over 2 million miles of revenue service, which is still a 25% um, decrease from this current fiscal year's budget. Um, so we have postponed several um, service increases that we envisioned for this current year, but never implemented. Um, and that includes, uh, for example, like the Route 42 uh, 30 minute expansion, um, and even in some situations, some local routes, um, including the Route 37 in West Sacramento. However, we do want to point out that if there are any type of um, service expansions, not necessarily restorations, but expansions, they do require board action and uh, public comment. So these are some of the levels that we are proposing to restore. And like I mentioned, that includes a lot of the local West Sacramento uh, routes. So we have uh, five additional AM and PM trips for the Route 40, which is a local uh, West Sacramento route that operates in the Bright Project communities. Um, then we have the Route 240 that also operates um, near the Brighton Project communities, as well as West Capitol, which is one of the main corridors. Um, in West Sacramento. So we have two additional trips there as well. Um, and then also getting into some of our express route service. So that includes Route 30, 43, Route 230, and the restoration of Route 44. So additional trips for uh, all three of those express routes. Um, and then going into what we were proposing as service expansions, but we postpone until uh, future years was the Route 42 A and B, which is our inner city route. Um, that includes those additional 30 minute trips, as well as that Route uh, 37 uh, that operates in the Southport area in West Sacramento. And jumping into the next slide. So this is just a general overview. You guys should have seen this chart in the staff report. And this just kind of gives more of a, a detailed breakdown of what type of service we were planning um, on operating this uh, upcoming um, fiscal year compared to our current fiscal year. So it shows our maximum number of trips that we plan on operating. Um, and so you kind of see a little bit of the comparisons there. Um, like I we mentioned earlier, it's still a decrease from what we originally planned, um, but most of the trips that we're planning on bringing back are restoration trips. So they're trips that have already been approved through the COA and when the COA was approved by our board. So we're not, again, we're not necessarily, at least for fixed route service, planning any expansion. It's just service restoration that was suspended during COVID and again, approved during the COA. And then we're gonna jump into micro. Um, so for the service area on Woodland, we aren't planning any kind of expansion. Um, in the town of Woodland, uh, the one thing to keep in mind is this is the service that we just brought on board uh, this past September, so it's still relatively new. Um, it still hasn't reached its one year birthday, so <laughs> this September will be um, the first full year of service in Woodland for microtransit. Um, in winters, you know, we are proposing a potential service expansion, and this is based off, you know, board feedback, community feedback. Um, you know, we are also looking at potentially bringing in another vehicle. Currently, right now, we only have one vehicle that operates in, in the service zone of Winters. Um, and we've seen um, a lot of our riders be impacted because of the distances that they have to travel between this service zone. 
So we're proposing an additional vehicle as well as expanding the service hours. Um, and then in Knights Landing and in Yolo, kind of the same um, situation where we also are proposing the service expansion of hours as well as adding an additional vehicle. Um, you know, we do want to remind everybody again that this is an expansion, and so this will re require board approval and public comment as well. Um, and then for paratransit levels, those will remain the same. We don't have any um, differences in, in there. I mean, they do vary based on the days of the year um, and the mileage as well, because it just depends on where people are traveling to. But um, as far as revenue hours, we don't anticipate any changes. It's the same as what we operated in the past fiscal year. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Um, I had I had one for the WESAC team, um, mm -hmm. and it, it relates back to what's being described as it's the restoration, especially of the local routes, or re really for that matter, any of the the things that are being restored. Um, just from a from a net revenue uh, standpoint or revenue over expenses, has it been Analyzed are 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 these routes that are being subsidized, or are they are are the restoration of services expected to pay for themselves? That's a good question. So, um, double check. I and I'll, I'll just go a step further uh, to say, you know, from our standpoint, given that they've been out of service for some time. Mm -hmm. You know, and unless the ridership data is there to support it, we just kind of have questions around. If they don't pencil, then what's what is the rationale for restoring them? So, so I have a, I, sorry, I'll, I'm going to jump in, Daisy, if, you, if mm -hmm. I may. Can you clarify what you mean by pencil? Because um, uh, we don't have any transit service that um, that that pays for itself. If you're talking about having the um, Fares collected by riders completely cover the cost of operations. That's uh, it. So, can you just clarify what you mean? Yeah, and that's what I expected to, to hear. I, I guess I'm just questioning if if these are routes that have been out of service for some period of time. What's the justification from either just a ridership projection or, you know, service need perspective that justifies restoring them? If we already have, in other words, if we already have a budget issue, um, and this this only makes that gap potentially worse. I'm just can trying you, to understand. Yeah, can you clarify what you mean by budget issue? Uh, th this Meaning, budget is, is is fully funded. This budget is, but I, I mean, just looking at the long term projection of of the challenges we all have with transit, it's just it's just a question. I think we have to ask in principle: Is it does it make sense to restore services when we know there's potentially a um, a gap in the future, especially when these when these routes have been you know uh, operating at their current levels for some period of mm -hmm. time. Unless mm -hmm. there's such a huge justification in terms of projected ridership that the, mm -hmm. the service need is there, mm -hmm. um, I think it's just the question we have to ask when, you know, we're asking our council to look ahead at, you know, how we're mm -hmm. going to fund that gap because mm -hmm. we know what's and, out there. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things to keep in mind is that, you know, we have, so the governor just laid their, sent his mandate down that, you know, we're going to have state workers that are going to be returning in June. Um, they're going to need to find some way to get to work. Caltrans has already had issues with parking even before COVID. This is something that, uh, you know, we've been kind of working with them for a while, um, trying to get the service out there. And then the other thing to keep in mind, too, is that, you know, the city of West Sacramento also just, you know, jumped in partnership with um, the A's um, MLB team. So they're going to be using Sutter Health Park. That's also going to require um you know, people getting from point A to point B, um, you know, the ridership is starting to pick up, um, but it, it's there. There's multiple factors to consider. And even though. You know, right now, it, you know, we're getting out of that whole post COVID, you know, if you look at the general perspective, you know, ridership is going down and we are going to need to address those needs. And this is one of those ways that we can do that. You know, people are returning back to work right now. The service in West Sacramento runs ends pretty early I think by like 6 p.m there pretty much isn't any more service um which doesn't really help um the communities in the brighton broderick area you know these are communities that are very transit dependent and 
you know, with the restoration of some of these early trips and later trips, it can help them get, you know, in and out of, you know, West Sacramento or even transferring to other um, forms of public transportation. Um, but. Yeah, and those are the, the couple things you cited there um, make a lot of sense in terms of things that would drive demand. Um, I think more so the the return of state workers to offices, which I hope I hope we're right about that. Mm -hmm. um, but as soon as possible. Um, but I think uh, I would just, again, kind of step back and look at it from a demand standpoint, um, unless you know that you have you have actual data once that happens, that shows uh, ridership demand is way up. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like you're, you're proactively putting the service back online in hopes that there's a response to it. And I just worry that by restoring it now you have. You know, headways that are that are hard to pull back if we ever get into a budget crunch again. So it's just I think we need to be really careful about um, restoring or expanding without without really good data to show that the demand is there. Mm -hmm. Just looking way ahead to to budget uh, challenges downstream. Mm -hmm. And I, I appreciate that perspective, Aaron. And you know, and it's, and it's helpful to understand you know where where the city is at with these issues. You know, this was the. This was the plan that our board approved. This was the mandate that they gave to us to restore these services as the pandemic lifted. And so it is board adopted policy that we restore these to these levels. And so I think it's just really important to put a distinction between restoration of service that was suspended during COVID and that our board has instructed us to restore and expansion of service. As you, as, as Daisy pointed out, we're not expanding any fixed route this year. We are proposing some expansions to Beeline based on, again, what we have seen and what we have heard from our board in response to the riderships that we've seen on Beeline. Um, so that is the only expansion that we are talking about in this year's budget. All other expansions have been postponed. Okay, and was was the board's direction uh, in terms of the time frame was with this coming fiscal year or was that sort of just a, you know, let's expand this, it when it makes sense to, or, or not, this, not expand, this, I'm sorry, restore it when it makes sense. This was, you know, this was a plan that was adopted in 2021, right, in the depths of the pandemic. Right. Um, and mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, you know, I think we've been putting this on pause in part because, you know, we know that a big amount of our ridership is UC Davis and downtown Sacramento, right? And those are those are the two big job centers, uh, you know, that we serve. UC Davis, you know, right, has been back in person for the last two years, um, but, you know, downtown Sacramento, not so much. And so with the governor's, you know, very public pronouncements and the uptick in ridership that we are already seeing on our existing services that go into downtown Sacramento, um, this seemed like something that we should be, you know, that this, this is the right time. Okay. Yeah, that, that's really the the crux of my question. There, it's more just the timing of it. If if we if we think it's happening, then okay, that's one thing. But to see the actual demand uh, numbers yeah. to a point where okay, it's it's we're beyond capacity of what we can currently serve, or or we made all the adjustments to our route times, and this is really needed. Um, I'm just trying to avoid a situation where three years from now, when you know whatever whatever other operating sources are are not available to us anymore. Um, not having to then again make cuts or have to come up with additional funding when we're competing with our own city budgets. So understood. Maybe we can um, as uh, we can share some of the the data that we have around recent ridership trends in the last few months um, uh, for for our services. We do That'd we do great. put that. I do, a, I do a, in our monthly executive director's report. We do we do share some of that ridership data. It's aggregated. Uh, we. Um, but we can break some of that out um, and share that with you. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. sure. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Oh, if there's no other questions, then we can we can keep moving and we can always come back um, to this. But uh, we're the, our next uh, presenter is going to be Chaz, and she's going to take you through the LTF STA allocations. Thanks, Daisy. Mm -hmm. OK, hello again. Um, just a quick overview on the Transport Transportation Development Act funds. The state transit assistance funds generated by a sales tax on 
fuel and diesel fuel, and then our local transportation funds, uh, which are funds derived from a quarter of a, of a cent um, on the general sales tax collected statewide. Um, FTA funds is what the district uses, 5307 and 5311, both have a local fund match requirement, um, which includes STA and LTF funds. Next slide, please. So this is just a quick summary on the uh, STN LTF funding for the fiscal year 24 25 as compared to the prior year. As we can see, we have some decreases. Uh, your jurisdictions captured um, by the percentages there and then also the amounts. Um, this is information that was included in the budget as well. Um, stop me anytime if you guys have questions. Um, and then this is just a, another high level overview of the budget, which you all have um, that we are proposing. Uh, not a lot of changes to administration. Um, we have the 6%, which accounts for some of the uh, COLA um, that will be proposed to the board in June, um, as well as some benefit increases um, that were assumed. Uh, this also includes a little bit um, of additional overtime due to having critical vacant positions, um, as well as increasing internship budget to reflect our actual um, demand. And then as Daisy covered, the service changes this year overall, uh, we aren't seeing much of a change, specifically in fixed route. The budget changes are mostly uh, a net of the six months of the planned expansion that was to happen in January 2024, and then routes that were restored or slightly expanded this year. Um, and then this also includes TransDev's uh, annual increase of about 3%. In addition to one new line item in this uh, budget that includes leasing eight buses at about $480,000 for the year, uh, which will be funded, as we know today, by the SB 125 money. And then paratransit, as Daisy mentioned, remains the same. Um, and then microtransit's increase reflects the expansion in the areas of Winters, Yolo County, and Knights Landing. Next slide, please. Then here we just have a snapshot um, that shows the STA and LTF funds as uh, funding each program that we have. You'll see administration at being funded at 49%, fixed route 36, microtransit 39, and paratransit at 48%. Next slide. Here is a little more of a drill down into our portfolio of funding sources as it relates to this 24-25 budget. As you can see, the STA and LTF funding um, is about 40% of our funding sources for this proposed budget. Um, and then below, it's uh, showing the program, 49%. Uh, it's, it's much of what you saw on the previous slide and also includes uh, our one-time funds to offset the 60% of the STA and LTF funds retained by the jurisdictions, which include CARES, CRISA, and the SB 125, which are all uh, three different single allocation funding sources aimed to provide transit operators with relief uh, funding from the effects of uh, the pandemic, COVID-19. And let's see here, next slide, please. And then this is just a combined uh, percentage uh, of the STA and LTF funding retained by the jurisdictions. Uh, STA and LTF combined, um, for example, Davis is 46.4. Um, and overall, you'll see there's some fractions of a percentage that change from last year to this year, but for the most part, it's a 50-50 split. Any questions there? I can go back to the slides if needed. Um, I'll go ahead and jump in. Uh, two slides back, you showed uh, what's one-time funds. Mm -hmm. So look mm -hmm. at what one-time funds there. So the CARES, CRIS, NSB 125, what percent of your budget is on one-time funds? Uh, for the CARES, it's 14. 
and then the CRISA, it's 4%. And this is this is the line with the plan that we had in the previous budget, which was to draw down uh, on all those funds in this 24, 25 year. Okay, and then SB 125 is 6%. So that means 24% of your budget is from one-time funds that are ending. Is that true? Well, the SB 125 is actually newer to us um, this year. And so that's what we are assuming for this year as far as the allocation that um, or so yellow just, TD. Just to remind on SB 125, this is the the one time funds that were passed by the as part of the budget deal last year by the governor. Mm -hmm. it's a, it provides five years of basically bridge funding for transit operations and capital. Um, so SACOG is responsible for allocating that funding. So they have just allocated us about three million dollars. Um, some of which we'll be using this year and then we'll be uh, and then there'll be other opportunities to they'll be looking and going back and they can, and updating their plan. They gave $60 million to SACRT and a $3 million to us and then some small amounts to some other operators. So these are one-time flexible funds um, that, you know, again, are kind of for the next five years or so. And they also do come with new state requirements around um, SACOG has some responsibilities around doing a deeper dive of auditing the, the finances of the transit agencies and understanding where the funding is going um, and looking at making some kind of long-term structural changes to state funding, other opportunities to stabilize um, uh, transit funding long-term. So this is meant to be a bridge while the state and transit agencies are working together to come up with long-term solutions. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, but still the CARES and CRISA, that's 18% of your budget is on one-time money that's going to be ending next year or? Our plan is to expend it in 24-25, yes. Okay, so a year from now we're going to be sitting here with 18% of that budget or uh, funding gone. That's what we know of today. Um, this is this is aligned with the conversation that you all had last year. Um, this was a part of the, the five year outlook as well of us drawing down on uh, the one time funds. We had a similar conversation expecting that in 2425, the STN LTF allocations would change and impact uh, the jurisdictions, but um, so far it does not. It does not look that way for 24-25. Okay. Okay. So, I, yeah, just my concern is that's 18% of your budget will be missing next year. That's like almost $4 million. So, right. I mean. And so, and so just, yeah, just to remind, I mean, this is exactly, we are not the only agency that is dealing with this expiration of the one-time federal funds, and that is why the legislature passed SB 125 to address that shortfall over the next five year period while then working on long term solutions. So so yes, the CARES and CRISA money is running away and the SB 125 funding is is ramping up. Uh, yeah, as I noted, we've received three million dollars of which we're going to be using about one point three this year. As you see here, that's six percent at one point three million dollars. And it's I is it it's approximately three million dollars that we received. Is that right, Chas? Could you say a bit more Correct. about the, that funding? Yeah. Yeah. So there's two cycles and in this first cycle we have a, three, a little over three million um, and then we're still in discussion and, and waiting on what's going to happen with cycle two. And just to chime in again, I I, I uh, in no way my earlier comments and uh, Autumn this is really for you. It, it's we know this. We know the position that that all transit agencies are in is unenviable in terms of the the challenge of, of providing a service that, you know, it, it doesn't pay for itself. It's 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 always been that way. It's meant to be um, supported by by government. Um, but I think a lot of the comments, the the ones I made, and what I think uh, we were just hearing, all speak to the the concern that we know this is coming. And so, given that reality, and and I, I just use the West Sac examples here. Um, if we know we're going to be adding to the expense side, where there's not a corresponding you know, balance of revenue to to support it. Um, it's just timing of some of those decisions. Does it make sense to go forward with, you know, re restoration of services, 
in the face of what we know might be coming next year. Hopefully it works out where there's a statewide solution, but I guess just as a as a budgeting matter, it just seems, you know, a, a little risky to uh, push forward with some of those things this year. So I hear you and, you know, and I will point out that we have not proceeded with any service expansions this year. We heard you last year. We did not move forward with any of those expansions. What we're proposing here are restorations. Um, you know, it, I think, and this is a fair question, and ultimately it's going to be up to our board to decide if they don't want to move forward with the restorations that they have approved uh, to bring back the service that was cut, you know, based on what may happen to the city's budgets four years from now. I understand your concern. I hear you. Ultimately, we are working to implement the will of our board and the board has to decide, you know, what takes precedence and priority for them. Is it keeping the city's whole or is it moving forward with the, the service increases that they have talked about? And so I'm not going to not propose what my board has asked me to do based on the concerns that I hear from you. Ultimately, you know, we will present what we have here. And, I, I, you know, I've, I've already talked to several of my members. I know that you're talking to them as well. At the end of the day, you know, they want us to work together, but we also where we have conflicting direction, <laughs> you know, that's why they're the ones who are sitting in those chairs and have to make those choices, right? Right, and, 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 and I mean, it's only a timing, but it's, it's not, it's, it's I, not get, a, I get the desire, desire to, or it's more of a service, or whatever they were, uh, 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 it's just, it's just a matter of how and when, especially considering, considering that you have a real on the real year where a big chunk of the budget is very concerned, and we're talking about having my acting experiences too, on top of that, on top of that. Autumn, this Ken, real quick. Um, there are some proposed expanded services next year in the form of microtransit, correct? Winters, Yolo County, Ice Landing, uh, at a fairly significant cost, it looked like. Uh, are those costs uh, going to be borne in any way by the county's LTF funding? Or I mean, if I read that one slide correctly, the county retains about 85% of its LTF. That's correct. And does the county come to the table to use some of that LTF to fund that, or would that come out of our SB 125? So the, yeah, the, the breakdown in terms of, could you go, uh, Daisy, forward to the slide that shows the kind of percentages retained by each jurisdiction? Um, uh, one more, I think. Or, uh, there it is. There yeah. So this, um, this breakdown, this is a formula that we inherited. <laughs> I will say we meaning me um, uh, in terms of the percentage that we uh, that is retained by each jurisdiction. I am not privy to the conversations that you all had, and maybe some of you were, I think maybe some of you were part of those conversations and maybe you weren't, uh, when this kind of breakdown, if you will, was negotiated. What we have done is worked to honor that um, allocation or division of resources, if you will. Um, and so uh, we backed into these numbers, you know, we we try mm -hmm. to keep these numbers the same. Right. And Chaz can speak more to the details on that. Um, right. I don't know why it is as diverse as it is uh, across the different jurisdictions. Yes, thank you, Autumn. And, and my knowledge is even more limited than Autumn's. Um, but as we already mentioned, we have maintained the same percentages that the jurisdictions are retaining. This was, um, if you will, a reverse calculation, starting from the same uh, percentage that, that you've received for the past couple of years. So to fit into, fit into that amount, um, the calculation ends up going backwards. But it's a great question, Ken. Um, this was something that, you know, I was looking at too. I didn't really understand the uh, how we came about um, allocating all of Yolo County's LTF funds to them. Um, from what I could gather, it appears that this was a change that happened in 2021, and it could be due to um, a conversation about the the service levels and what we were running at that time, and and there was an agreement that was made that we would only retain STF money from Yellow County and and 
uh, essentially give them all of it. And then we've just kind of copied and pasted those percentages in the next uh, in the next two years, three years now. So I don't have an answer for that, but it is a great question. And um, I don't have an answer because we just kept right. the percentages the way that, that uh, sure. they've been for the past few years. Well, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I suspect there's nobody on the board, probably nobody at the transit district, and maybe many of the folks that are uh, around from TAC days five, six years ago even know where this percentage allocation came from. So maybe worth a conversation at some point. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly, I'm certainly happy to have that conversation. You know, I have sort of seen this as a third rail, if you will, mm -hmm. and uh, wanted to, you know, not. Uh, <laughs> well, right. we have these, we have these one-time funds that allow us to, as as Chaz spoke, you know, back into this allocation, right? We have had the, we've had the the one-time you know, federal funds. Now we have the SB 125 funds that have allowed us to not have to rock this particular boat. But you know, you're right yeah. that the service levels have changed from year to year. Like you know, we now with the B line service in Woodland, you know, we didn't do any changes to Woodland's formula based on the right. fact that we now have B line in Woodland, for example, right? So, um, I. I think it's, you know, if it's, if, if you know, if, if the group is interested and willing to engage in that conversation, I don't think not for this fiscal year, but maybe we start a conversation soon, you know, to have, a, you know, more open, you know, discussions about revisiting this in time for the next year's budget. Good. That seems like a fair question to ask. Yeah, absolutely. Do we know when these percentages were set for for jurisdiction? It's just this is kind of new to me. I'm just curious. So this was, as Chaz mentioned, this kind of uh, there was a shift. I think there's been a couple of different shifts. And when we back went back and looked through the history and tried to parse this, we saw there was this. This was 2021, so beginning of COVID, mm -hmm. right? Um, then there was a. We go back to 2014, 2015. There was a shift then as well. So. Um, where mm. kind of the, the numbers seem to change. So it looks like it's kind of on a maybe been on a five year cycle or something. Okay. Yeah. And I think the big driver for this was who pays for the 42 and um, mm. right, because the 42 is mm. far and away the biggest, you know, cost and it serves touches all the jurisdictions except Woodland. Right. And so I think it I think a lot of the negotiations were around how much each jurisdiction is paying for the 42. And then that kind of then gets rolled up kind of more broadly. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, and I figured ours might have something to do with our age of incorporation perhaps, but mm. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know either. Yeah. Okay. Um I can just throw a few comments from the past discussions I had with Terry. Uh, my understanding and this is probably, you know, 5 10 years ago is that Terry or, you know, slash the finance people that were working for the district when Terry was around um, had kind of a cost breakdown, miles, hours for each route, and then each route was kind of assigned to each city. Most of the routes were paid for, you know, I mean, most, you know, you have an intracity route in Woodland, it's 100% on Woodland. If you have an intracity route in West Sac or Davis, 100% on them. Uh, I, Autumn, I think you're right, the 42 was a pretty big, big player in the cost because it's the most expensive route there is, but there was, uh, I remember look, uh, meeting with Terry numbers, a number of times about looking at the different costs for the different routes and the assignment of those costs. Um, I can't speak too much to West Sac. I, I was familiar with what Woodland was looking at. Um, and there was some uh, a factor in that was what funding that each city had, because uh, I know West Sac has 5311 or, you know, the district receives money on behalf of West Sac 5311, Woodland 5307, and then Davis has 5307 that it receives separately. So anyways, there was an attempt uh, to match those things up. I, I mean, it was, I mean, it was a very complicated spreadsheet, I would say that I, you know, only peripherally saw and was aware of. Um, but I, you know, if you're looking for historical information, that was, that's what I saw as a member of the TAC for, you know, the last 19 years or so. 
I, I'm not necessarily saying we have to get back to that in its purest form, uh, but I know that's that's a, the root of 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 probably where we where we were when you know Terry walked out the door. Um, so, anyways. Okay. Thank you. A, thank, thank you, you Brad. Brad. That, that is really helpful, and yes, that's consistent with my understanding as well. And that is still how we do it for the routes that are wholly within one city. You know that that is fully funded uh, through the fifty three eleven funding for that city. You know, in combination with the, the local match through, from the STA or LTF, um, and it's really the forty two where it gets squishy. Mm -hmm. And it's still very complicated spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as it relates to, uh, I'll speak on behalf of Woodland, right? We appreciate the fact that you have um, honored our request to try to protect uh, our reliance on our LTF for local road improvements and other uh, projects here. So appreciate that. Um, it'd be helpful. Uh, we talked a little bit about what ridership is doing uh, with some of the 42 uh, enhancements to service this past year. It'd be helpful to learn at some point you know what has that translated to in terms of additional ridership uh and you know additional costs and you know is that a sustainable service you know given the ridership and projections for how that evolves as uh, state returns to to the office um so probably not for this meeting but i would benefit from getting an understanding of where we're heading with uh, uh with ridership yeah, absolutely. We can uh, we can provide some updated numbers. And again, I, we did have our, our last executive director's report, which went out, I want to say the last week or the week before, mm -hmm. had the um, ridership data aggregated, you know, for all the routes and then the 42 broken out in particular. Right. Um, but again, we can provide breakdowns on per route um, basis um, uh, for the TAC as well. One thing I will say, uh, and if you look, if you look at the, if you look at the, the executive director's report, you'll see, you know, one of the things we're trying to get away from is that, you know, since time immemorial, this agency has relied on manual data collection, meaning the driver has to press the button um, to count our riders. Uh, we then we get some data through through the Connect card, um, but it's uh, it's not great data. Um, and so we we saw we saw an unseasonably large dip in our Route 42 ridership this year. Uh, and we realized it was in large part due to the fact that we had a bunch of new drivers who thought that UC Davis students, because they ride for free, they weren't pressing the button. Mm. So we just have, you know, it's, I don't love our data. And it's part of the reason that, you know, I didn't feel comfortable moving forward with the Route 42 expansion because we just don't have good data. <laughs> right. um, so last year, the board did approve, uh, you know, that investment in automatic passenger counters. We raised, you know, we went out and found money for that. Um, so that procurement has happened. We are, those should be installed and completed. And then we were just going to have much more accurate data. Um, these are little sensors that are installed in the buses and actually and uh, count people getting on and off the buses. Um, so I just, I always feel like I want to give that caveat when we yeah. talk about our ridership. <laughs> <laughs> And, and thanks for that, because that's a that's a huge difference from previous. You know, we don't need to go and go there, but it, it's it, it matters to us. So we we try to make everything, you know, data driven. Uh, so we appreciate that about uh, your lead of YTD. Uh, I'm going to be on the phones. I have to go pick up my kids, so I'm going to be on, but I won't be on camera. So I'll get back on in a second. Right. Thank thanks. you, Aaron. Thank you. Drive safe. All right. Um, other questions on this piece before we move on and talk about the work plan? And this is Kim with Woodland. <clears throat> um, I'm a little late to learning about some of this, and I was poking through the website looking at some reports, and I'm maybe it's somewhere I didn't find, but looking at, because um, we've come across this with some other agencies we've been working with, that um, your allocation to all the member agencies is based on your budget for the year. Um, but I wasn't able to find where do you do a comparison of what your actual results were to the budget, what happens to the funds that you collected that didn't get used. And, you know, there was a mention of some key positions being vacant. Do you factor that into when you do your budget? I just, you know, they're kind of detailed questions, but I have a few of those that I would be interested to understand better. OK, um, did you want to did you want me to answer them now or uh, as a follow up? 
if you know the answer now, great. Right? Okay, so so um, the first question was about comparing, I think you said, actual to what was budgeted. Okay. Was that, that was your question? Correct. Okay, um, yes, so we do. Um, the presentation in the budget itself doesn't have a side-by-side -side comparison that includes actual results, um, but this is something that we can include in the future. Um, you know, we have our internal documents, and then of course we report on budget to actual uh, around the time when we present our uh, audited financial statements. Um, so that is something that we can incorporate if that's helpful information. As far as anything that we didn't implement in any savings or um, uh, any any savings that we have from the previous budget, they do get factored into this this current budget and any budgets going going forward. Um, that was a part of preparing this budget is factoring in what we uh, did not plan um, and did not implement in 2023-24, the current fiscal year that we're in, um, as well as um, you know identifying any other savings. Um, the third question, I think, was around uh, vacant positions. So yes, we do factor that in. That's why um, we also saw a, a slight increase in some overtime uh, for the critical vacant positions that may take us a while to recruit for those three, three positions I believe we're at now. Um, our experience in the past two years is that we've uh, struggled a bit with uh, recruitment and, and having a, a good pool of candidates to fill our position. So we factored in a little bit of time um, for that recruitment to happen in, in case you know we're not successful and takes us a little bit more time. Um, so we do try to factor in the current situation, you know, what we're dealing with, and then also fold in anything realistically that we know we're not going to complete in this 23-24 and use that, um, recognize that budget savings in, in, um, and use it in the future year. I think that was all of them. And I would just add one thing, um, which is that our audited financial statement for the uh, last fiscal year Will, is it is actually being presented to the board at this at next week's meeting concurrently um, with this draft budget. So it's it's been it, the audit took a little bit longer this year. Um, it was a bit slower, so it was just completed. What about I would want to say about a month ago? Mm -hmm. um, Correct. So March. Yeah. So we can share. We can we can also send that over to you. That's available now, and I'm not sure if it's yet po if it's posted on our website yet, but it, it it's should not. Be. Um, yeah. I was waiting to present it to the board first. Fair enough. Yeah, we'll we'll get we'll get that out to the to the TAC, um, and it should it'll be posted on our website. I think I recall from last year the district has a fair reserve. Uh, accumulated and part of that is due to the CARES funding. Uh, that gets wrapped into the budget presentation that's going in June, I presume. Correct. And any preliminary projections on where you might land at the end of this year uh, in an unaudited un un capacity? Um, I do have projections. Um, that's basically what I, you know, um, use to prepare this current year budget. So, we do recognize a little bit of, um, I actually, I, I think I, I'll need to follow up with this, uh, follow up on this question um, because there's a few factors that, that I haven't identified yet, but for the most part um, with not implementing this, the six month uh, expansion, we are seeing some budget savings there. Um, that was, that that budget savings was used in this 24-25 year. Um, so for the most part, you know, it, it, what it's looking like projected is that we're going to have a little bit of, of savings um, for not implementing what we originally planned. Got it. Okay. I'll follow up with you, Ken. All right. Appreciate that. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions for Chaz? If not, we will go to the um, work plan. Oh, did you want to talk about this, Chaz? Oh, yes, guys. Um, 
I found a little bit of a, a linking issue on the STA and LTF table here. It didn't change any of the amounts that, that you're retaining. It just, what, they were just sublinks um, in between the totals that I had to correct. So this will be provided in the updated uh, budget document. But as I said, it didn't change um, your, your allocations, but I just wanted to have that in there if, in case anyone noticed. We had one, one person who noticed, so appreciate that. Right, let's talk about the work plan. So um, I wanted to just share a few highlights. Now the full uh, the full work plan, there's a kind of like a big um, spreadsheet that is in the in tables, bunch of tables that are in the back of the budget. They're an appendix to the budget. Um, you'll have to forgive us. Our, our communications director, uh, Christopher Quanley, who many of you know, he's been out on medical leave since the beginning of March. So we literally have had one intern who's now gotten a job that was doing our communication. So we just, we didn't have any capacity. So the budget will look nicer and so will all the work plan and everything else. But right now we've got, uh, Chris is back next week. So we're very much looking forward to having things zhuzhed again. Um, but apologies for the kind of funky formatting on that. But that's what you get when I do it myself. Um, all right. So, you know, feel free to ask any questions. There's a lot of detail in there. I didn't want to go through everything. I know I want to use your time well. So I'm just highlighting a couple of kind of major things that uh, are on the work plan. Um, but again, feel free to ask questions about anything you see in there. So in terms of our uh, multimodal planning program, this is Brian's wheelhouse. Um, we are going to be completing planning for the new downtown Woodland Transit Center. Um, we'll be completing community outreach and planning for the YOLO Active Transportation Corridors project. Um, we're going to be, we are kicking off our short range transit plan. We're doing that um, kind of on the same timeline as the city of Davis and Unitrans so that we can kind of leverage each other's efforts and actually ended up ultimately selecting the same consultant as well, which is helpful. So we're hoping that there's some good synergies there. And then also separately, our zero emission bus implementation plan. So this is as part of our requirement by the Air Resources Board to transition to a zero emission fleet. We need to plan our infrastructure for the bus yard. You know, how are we going to uh, how are we going to power a, a, a new electric fleet? And you heard Chaz mention that we have a new expense of leasing CNG buses this year, leasing up to eight CNG buses. This is just because our CNG fleet is aging. Um, and it is unreliable and we have buses that we really should not be running anymore, um, but we don't want to invest in a bunch of new CNG vehicles. We are purchasing three, um, but then we don't want to, we, we want to transition, we need to transition to zero emission. So those leased, those leased vehicles will help us bridge for the next couple of years while we are getting our fueling infrastructure, our, you know, basically our charging infrastructure, you know, up and running so that we can start buying more um, battery electric buses. So that's what that planning effort's about. Um, we're developing an expanded countywide TDM program. So as part of the mitigation dollars for the YOLO 80 program, their VMT mitigation strategy includes a pretty significant investment in an expanded YOLO commute program. So Brian and his team will be working with YOLO commute to you know, basically envision what does that look like? Um, and how does the YOLO commute program need to change as it goes from what, like a $50,000 budget to a $500,000 annual budget, which is, you know, pretty significant growth and making sure that, um, you know, that we have an effective program and an effective use of those dollars. And then uh, also new this year, we're going to be doing a countywide household travel survey, um, which you know should provide a useful source of data around travel behavior in Yolo County for us and also for you. We hope that this can be a useful uh, data set that you can also utilize to uh, for your um, for when you're applying for project, you know, for applying for grants, whether it's ATP or other sources of funding, um, having some updated um, travel data that we want to have and share with you all. Um, let me stop there and just see if there's any questions on multimodal before we go to transit operations. Any questions on any of that? Well, Autumn, any chance the TDM program that the district's working on might be something that cities can tear off of or just plug into uh, as yeah, we're, we're needing to do the same as we you know, adopt new specific plan areas, right? It calls for TDM plans to be prepared. Yeah, Brian, go for it. Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Ken. So that and the, and the household travel survey are are um, really sort of uh, complementary to each other because everybody has, all of us have 
you know, our climate action adaptation plans. You need to have a baseline of data for what your, you know, mode share is. Um, so the household travel survey will give you that baseline. And then we hope to update that periodically. Now, the countywide TDM program would ex would uh, we expect would uh, expand Yolo commutes, you know, programming from being a you know membership fee membership based organization to um, you know programming that all uh, residents of Yolo County would have access to, similar uh, perhaps in concept to Solano County's uh, Solano Mobility um, program, and um, we are guiding that process through the Yolo Commute uh, Board of Directors, all of whom have uh, uh, all the cities and Yolo County have representatives that serve on that because um, with our appreciation, you guys are all Yolo Commute members. Um, so it made sense. That's the only group that's working in a countywide TDM related capacity. Um, so yes, we would expect that um, uh, that cities and the counties would participate and we will have a dedicated process that will dive deeper and include more local agency staff and um, executive levels to help us shape that TDM program. Yep, thanks, Brian. Right, uh, unless there's other questions on this, let's move on to um, to transit operations. So you already heard, uh, next slide, Daisy. Yeah, you already heard Daisy talk about the service changes that were you know, uh, planned for this year, so I won't talk about that. I'm just going to talk about some of the other uh, complementary pieces that transit operations team is going to be working on. So analyzing beeline ridership data and feedback and considering adjustments. So again, you know, this is this is not something that we're just doing with the budget. This would be subject to board approval, and that could include the expansions for both Knights Landing and Winners that we talked about, as well as for the City of Woodland beeline service. Not We're not looking at any expansions, but potentially fine-tuning or reducing some of those hours, you know, if we find that we're not, um, you know, we don't have the ridership to justify, for example, the like Friday and Saturday nights until 11 p.m. or 10 p.m. or whatever it is. So, we, you know, we've committed to continuing, you know, continually looking at that data and bringing it back to the board uh, and, and as well as, as as you all and making any adjustments, you know, as the case may be. Um, we will be, while well, we're not expanding the Route 42 AB, we will be revisiting the schedule and routing to serve the new Downtown Woodland Transit Center whenever that is ready to go, and also to address some of the delays and detours that we're seeing in Downtown Sacramento due to special events. Our right, routing right now, we have to kind of routinely detour um, because of the city of downtown, city of Sacramento has made the decision that they wanted to close down streets um, for safety concerns, uh, which means that ironically, while our 42 would perfectly serve of Golden One Center uh, events because of the rerouting, we, uh, you know, it it ends up give, leading to delays. So, um, and and also means that we don't stop it anywhere near the Golden One Center uh, when there's events happening. So we want to see if we can, you know, fix that to fix some of those issues while we're re rerouting and retiming. Um, we also want to complete, as I mentioned earlier, complete the transition to automatic passenger counters so that we have better data. Um, and we also want to improve our ADA paratransit passenger tools, policies, and management practices. This is really something that we haven't touched since I've started. You know, there's a lot, um, there's a lot of tools like, like just like we have the RideCo app, there are apps now that allow paratransit passengers to, you know, to book apps online. Currently, our passengers have to have to call and they can't book rides the same day. Um, and we also have not updated our policies and management practices like applications are still paper applications. There's no way to apply online. Uh, we don't have great practices in place for um, asking people to reapply or redetermine eligibility on a regular basis, which can lead to some abuse of the system where you have people maybe who were temporarily eligible, um, but they've continued to ride because nobody has checked. We haven't been checking eligibility on a regular basis. I think it was last checked maybe four years ago. So um, those are some of the, the updates and changes that we want to make to just make sure we're both, you know, um, use, it's a very expensive service and we want to make sure we're only to providing it to those who absolutely, you know, need it. Um, and, and as well, for those customers who do need it, we want to improve their experience by, you know, doing things like, you know, same day online booking and, um, uh, you know, and an online application. So uh, let me pause there and see if there's any questions on transit operations. Okay, if not, we'll keep going. 
Um, communication. So, uh, so we do, uh, you know, so I will say first, you know, Chris has been out, uh, you know, for the last couple of months. So he has not had, had a chance to, to weigh in on this work plan at all. So, you know, subject to change upon his return. Um, but the things that we know are a priority for our communications team this year, a, a new marketing campaign targeting state workers who are returning to downtown Sacramento, of course, as we've talked about earlier. We want to make sure as those folks are forming new commute habits after being at home for the last four years that, you know, that we want them to be forming good new habits, um, including using our services. We want to explore marketing partnerships for major sports events and special events. I think, uh, you know, the fact that the A's are going to be here for a few years, um, as well as we're just seeing more and more, uh, you know, sports, sport events and special events. And we want to, you know, take advantage of the opportunity to get people using those services, our, our services to get to those events. Um, we want to continue our Beeline marketing promotions and partnerships. And we want to also continue marketing our new Route 42 service to UC Davis students and staff. Um, so those are some of our highlights for communications. Uh, there are a bunch of other internal work plan items that you'll see um, in the attachment, but I did to, again, to use everyone's time well, I'm not going to spend time on those, but happy to answer any questions that you have on those. So I'll stop there. Okay, not hearing a lot of questions on the work plan. Um, good. Well, um, I'll take that as <laughs> I'll take no questions as a good thing. Uh, always feel free to follow up with any additional questions you have on that. And hopefully you see the synergies and the alignment between the work plan and the budget. That was very much our intention is to have it be one process you know, um, that where we can align our resources, both as far as our staff and our budget, you know, around a common set of goals for the year. Um, let me just say a few words um, about the process going forward, just to remind everybody what our budget process looks like. So next uh, tonight, our Citizens Advisory Committee is meeting and they're going to be um, getting presentations on this as well. We'll be getting their feedback. Um, uh, the board will have an informational discussion on the work plan and budget next Monday uh, at the, the their May board meeting, and then it will come back to the board for action at their June board meeting. Um, so uh, there's still, an, and uh, so in the last few years, they've taken a final action to approve a final budget in June, but under our bylaws, they can also um, adopt a provisional budget and then can come back for a final budget in July if need be. So so if there are if there are any outstanding concerns that are not addressed by the June board meeting, we do have an, an additional month beyond that um, to address any any remaining concerns that that you or they may have. Um, so that's our process. And then the next meeting of this group is, you know, since we meet quarterly, won't be will be after the budget, um, the budget cycle is concluded. So let me pause there and see if there's any questions on the process or, or thoughts or questions. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. I know we're past this discussion on, you know, the roots and stuff, but it just keeps coming to my mind. And we we sort of talked about it a little bit with, you know, Chaz and Daisy, but I, I really want to figure out how I can identify what an, a restoration is going to cost the city on a certain line. So say take Route 40, we are restoring that service, um, but I can't figure out a way to understand how much that, just that costs. And I really wanna know, <laughs> you know, just just to under, have a better understanding of, you know, okay, well, who's writing it? How much ridership do we have there? And how much is it gonna cost for just that that one expansion, or not, not expansion, restoration, sorry. Uh, so, uh, I mean, they, they all cost money. You're expanding, you're restoring, it still costs money. And I just want to know how much or how we can identify the routes in West Sacramento, how much these restorations are costing. And, you know, any any help we can get doing that, um, you know, and it's, it could be in the five-year budget. I would just love these things specifically identified so that we have as much information as we can. And then also, being able to follow up with, are these routes effective? So we've restored it, but a lot has changed since the COA. So, uh, you know, having the ability to say, yeah, the, you know, we've restored this route and there's definitely increasing ridership on this line. You know, I would like to have that information as well. So just, just throwing that out there. Thank you, Jason. Jason, some of those questions, um, 
will be answerable through our um, short range transit plan process. So we'll be consolidating a lot of that information in that process. So it won't it wouldn't be you know ad hoc. You might want that information sooner. We can we can you know try to get you what you need sooner. But just wanted to uh, you know reassure the group that the short range transit plan should um, you know tackle a lot of those issues. Because we that are interested awesome. ourselves. We're interested ourselves in whether or not the routes that we're doing make sense. So we're going to be doing a land use and and route analysis. I'm looking at future growth scenarios where growth is occurring in uh, in the county and whether or not our routes are logically lining up with uh, where the ridership is and where the where the access needs to be. And I'll say I see I see your hand, Andrea. Before I go to your question, I want to I want to jump in and say two things on that as well. One of the things we're doing with the short range transit plan is having them look at a variety of financial scenarios, right? So that if we do need to cut service, where are we cutting service, right? If we have you know, if the state passes some magical bailout plan where we are, you know, where we can double service, where would we double service, right? Like, maybe we're not going to be quite that pie in the sky. But yes, so that that SRTP is very much and comprehensive operations analysis is very much intended to give us that snapshot of where we are now and look at if we do need to cut service because we don't have the budget to sustain it, where would we do that? But, you know, this is where I'm hesitant to start talking about cutting service now because we haven't done that analysis. We haven't done that look at where the ridership is, where people are going. Um, and that's when we would, you know, make those decisions. So it's not like we're saying we're just forever we're going to expand service. We just want to make sure if when we're looking at service cuts, if we need to, that we're doing that rooted in better data and information than we have right now. And then, Perfect. and then, and to yeah. your question, to your first question, Jason, on you know how much would this service restoration cost on a per trip basis? I actually, I'm looking at Chaz and Daisy, my my who who know these numbers a lot better. I'm just asking, is that is that a number that we can calculate? I, I'm yes. seeing how yeah. nodding. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, we can calculate it because we have all of it broken out, um, Jason, by miles and hours. So typically what we do is we determine how much each trip um, uses and it's its mileage and the hours. So that would be awesome mm -hmm. to send to us, you know, whenever we can to, to Stephanie and I, just so that we can start getting kind of a better handle on the cost of these just generally and have a, an understanding in the big picture of how it all kind of fits together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Autumn, actually, Andrew, sorry, had her hand up first. No, go ahead, Ken. That's fine. I was just say, Autumn, I think the board would benefit from from knowing, right, what their directive to you is actually going to cost in terms of true dollars. Um, yeah. Yeah. And for the very reasons that you, you stated around, you know, getting better data going forward for any future expansions, I think, Right, that's a good reason to ask the board. Maybe want to pause before we actually restore any service until we have a much more comprehensive understanding of where we're at today, where we're heading, both financially and from a, you know, ridership standpoint. So, we would fully support right you, and I will talk to my board representatives to to back you up to say, hey, you know, maybe we should pause for six months to a year to to get better data, better understanding before we start to restore service. Yeah, and my my comment and question was essentially what Ken just said. So, um, yeah, because if 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 we are for if we don't know, or maybe this is a question, uh, if there is an upcoming eighteen percent, you know, budget loss of funding, where how does that get plugged? Is this just a year to year conversation that I mean, you've already mentioned we're going to be here potentially going to be here talking about the same things and and the restoration is anticipatory. It sounds like anticipatory of the demand that would be borne by things like the state workers coming back two days a week or three days a week. And so has that. Has that calculus been done in terms of where you landed on the the restoration of the routes? So that's a little bit different than what Ken was saying. But I, I the, the question is, what is going to be the impact that we need to explain to our community members and our electeds on where this funding is going to come from? And is it going to come from allocations that would normally be uh, 
provided to the locals. So, yeah. Okay. So we so we can work on getting that um, uh, we can work on getting those cost estimates out there to you all so that you understand what the um, you know what we're talking about in terms of real dollars. Um, and then uh, just a note, you know, Andrea, you know, talked about is this just kind of a, every year we have this conversation. We do, you know, we did last year do a five year for financial forecast for the first time, and we're committed to updating that on a regular basis. Chaz being Chaz is not satisfied doing it the way we did last year because we assumed, you know, there was no there was no cost escalations built on on inflation. You know, she she's wanting to do a better job of it this year, and I know she's got a draft of it. I haven't seen it yet. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's it's coming soon. I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Chaz. Um, it's definitely something that I'm looking at, you know, as Autumn mentioned, you know, I would like to do something that is a little more. It's The current one is not not realistic. It's just very simplified. Um, but I think it will be more helpful to us and to all of you to see a little more detail there to see kind of where there's some some uh, concern or any volatility um so it's something that i'm working on now I don't quite have a draft i'm i'm but i am working on it right now and i hope to have something by the june meeting um thanks Chaz. you're welcome all right um, last, last question um uh, for me i promise but uh for your board meeting next week, uh, will any of this conversation or these questions be shared with the board members? Uh, do we need to sort of convey them to our board members or both? Uh, any advice so we're in sync would be helpful. Yeah, so the packet goes out tomorrow. <laughs> so obviously the timing is not ideal, but we have actually held off on finalizing the staff reports because we wanted to, as much as possible, very quickly try to capture the feedback we get from you and our Citizens Advisory Committee tonight. So, I mean, technically we have till Friday to get the packet out, but we don't want to do that. We want to give our board plenty of time. So we will do as much as we can to capture, you know, comments from today or at least broad brush, um, but then we'll also kind of do verbal, I'll, I'll, we'll do verbal as well in our presentation and we'll have more time to prepare. So um, we are taking notes, all of this, all the notes will be, again, I don't think we're going to have, you know, fully baked notes in the packet sure. that goes out tomorrow, but um, but they ab absolutely will have it um, for sure for June. Um, so I would say, given the timing, it doesn't hurt to talk to them before next Monday, just because it's such a tight turnaround. And that's just right. simply due to the scheduling and making a time that worked for everybody's schedule. So. Sure. OK. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for all your time and questions and, and attention. We appreciate you. Thank, thank you. you for all your hard thank work you, everybody. on this. Yep. All right. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for thank uh, you guys. to meet all of you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.